Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jason Marzak, Director of the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center. Uh, Ambassador Chapman, Ambassador Forrester, so important that you're joining us today at this pivotal moment for U.S.-Brazil relations. Uh, I'm also very pleased to welcome Adrian Arst, uh, who all of you know is the founder of the Adrian Arst Latin America Center, as well as the founder of the Adrian Arst Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center, Executive Vice Chair of the Atlantic Council, and also, real importantly for today's discussion, has a long and deep relationship with Brazil. Uh, Adrian is an incredibly accomplished businesswoman and philanthropist, and she will introduce the two ambassadors uh, after uh, the general's remarks. Before launching into today's discussion, I think it's also very important to take a moment to say that the last week here in the United States has brought to the forefront long-standing problems in our country and the need for us to collectively work to address the inequalities in our society. I've been thinking a lot these days of the words of Martin Luther King Jr., one of which he said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. For the Adrian Arts Latin America Center, this is a moment to double down on our mission and to continue across the hemisphere to advance policies that will promote socioeconomic prosperity for all. Today's conversation, which also comes amid the coronavirus pandemic and new travel restrictions for those coming from Brazil, will also be an important opportunity to hear from both ambassadors on how the US and Brazil can deepen trade and investment. This event also marks the start of the next phase of a multi-year effort for us to explore, along with Apex Brazil, the AmCham, and other partners, how the U.S. and Brazil can expand commercial relations for mutual benefit with the perspective that our relations must go beyond any one moment in time and beyond any one administration in time. This work was born from mutual understanding by both countries of the importance of seizing on commercial opportunities that have the potential to open new doors for economic growth. Our discussion today will be moderated by the center's associate director and the Brazil lead in the center, Roberta Braga. But first, I want to turn the virtual floor over to General Garçon Menandro from Apex Brazil, our partner in this important and ongoing work. General will give a few moments of, com of comments and then he will hand the program over to Adrian Arst. So with that, General, the floor is over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first of a sequence of four webinars that begins today dedicated to the discussion of the U.S.-Brazil trade and investment relations. It's an honor to make these virtual introductory remarks and represent the Brazilian Trade and Investment Promotion Agency, Apex Brazil. I'd like to especially thank Jason Marczak and Roberta Braga directors of the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center at the Atlantic Council, and also greet Ms. Deborah Vieiras, MCM CEO in Brazil, an outstanding partner of us. We are truly honored with your presence today. I also greet all the participants. Thank you for your presence and time. We know how limited this precious resource called time is. Very briefly, Apex Brazil is a nonprofit agency linked to the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Apex Brazil represents 14,000 Brazilian companies, which are responsible for 30% of Brazilian exports. We work hard to gather relevant players, putting government and the private initiative at the same table in a movement to promote. Brazilian business abroad, and to attract foreign direct investment FDIs. We are glad that our work has helped Brazil to be the first global FDI destination last year. According to the Central Bank of Brazil, our economy received $78 billion of foreign direct investments in 2019. This number shows investors' confidence in the long term because Brazil is a country of millions of people and opportunities. It has been exactly three months that we launched the English version of the report so-called U.S.-Brazil Trade and FDI Report, Enhancing the Bilateral Economic Relationship. Report written by Brazilian and American trade and investment specialists, 
outlined concrete short and long-term actions for the economic synergies between the two largest economies in the Americas, with a focus on concluding a free trade agreement as a final step. As we all know, the recent scenario has changed. The world economy had a severe impact. The pandemic brought huge challenges in terms of rethinking trade and investment strategies. Thus, we take the chance today, not only to launch the Portuguese version of the report, but also gather highly qualified and insightful opinions about the way ahead. At Apex, we've been doing our homework to mitigate the impacts on Brazilian business. Indeed, we have 23 new work fronts dealing with trade and investment issues related to the COVID-19, which includes hot sites, webinars like this today, podcasts, a business plan for exporters in times of the pandemic, and a handful of useful dashboards. Among the dashboards, I call your attention to the one dedicated to the Brazilian exports to the US, disaggregated by state level. I do invite you to navigate and explore this tool. The link will be available at the end of the presentation. We are confident that with the political will and the support of the private sector, Brazil and US, the Western hemisphere, large economies and democracies have a unique opportunity to explore new ways to deepen their bilateral trade and investment relationship. Today, we all have the privilege to learn directly from our distinguished guests, Ambassador Nestor Foster from Brazilian Embassy in Washington, DC, and Ambassador Todd Chapman from US Embassy in Brasilia, Brazil. Please welcome our speakers. We look forward to listening and learning the latest developments on the US-Brazil economic relationship. Now I will give the floor to Ms. Adrian Arst, Executive Vice Chair of the Atlantic Council. Thank you very much. And thank you, General and Apex, for your partnership and support. <clears throat> um, I went to Brazil for my first time in January 1964. And I went to Brasilia, where Ambassador Chapman is now located. Um, it was a brand new city and very exciting. Ambassador Chapman has been there in the embassy since March 29, um, arrived at a very significant point in history and all of our lives. Prior to that, he was ambassador to Ecuador. He is a career foreign service uh, diplomat and brings a great deal of experience and knowledge um, to his current post. Ambassador Forster um, is actually um, living more or less across the street from me. The Brazilian embassy is literally across the street. And so um, as soon as we can with social distancing, we'll walk back and forth and greet each other. Um, Ambassador Forster has a very, very significant career in diplomacy for his country. He actually served at the, Amer the embassy here uh, in several occasions. And not long ago, I had the special honor to have been awarded the Brazilian Order of the Rio Branco, which um, was presented to me by Ambassador Forster. I think the uniqueness of having these two ambassadors brought together so closely at this time um, is very fortunate for all of us to hear their points of view today and juxtapose to each other on the screen. And with that, I turn this over to the Associate Director and our Brazil lead, Roberta Braga. 
Thank you so much, Adrian. Thank you, Jason, General Manandru. Um, I am so happy to be here today moderating this conversation with both ambassadors. This is, as was mentioned, uh, the beginning of really a second leg in our work on U.S. Brazil trade and FDI. Um, we've been looking at this topic now for a couple of years in partnership with Apex and AmCham, and so I couldn't be happier to be kicking off this conversation in such a, a unique moment. So much has changed since we began looking at this topic, and really it's um, advancing a relationship that the two countries share for so long. So um, I'd like to kick off the conversation with a question to both of you, Ambassadors Forrester and Chapman. Um, as I mentioned, the U.S. and Brazil, we all know this very well, have been hit very hard by the pandemic, um, were the countries most impacted by it. And you both kind of began your presence in, in your respective diplomatic roles, more or less just as this was developing. And so um, I wanted to ask you sort of on a personal note and also as ambassadors, what were your priorities coming in and how has this pandemic affected how you approach those priorities? Um, how has the current context in which we're living impacted your roles as ambassadors of your respective countries? And I'll start with you, Ambassador Chapman. Well, thank you very much, Roberta, and thank you to the Atlantic Council for hosting us for this event. It's a pleasure to be speaking with the Atlantic Council once again, as I've done in the past. A special privilege to be with Adrian. Thank you for all your leadership and, and for Jason and just the whole group. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. And it's always a pleasure to be with my friend and colleague, Ambassador Forster. Uh, of course, when anticipating arriving in Brazil, uh, back when I was doing my hearing, etc., we had a very uh, expansive a dialogue and expansive agenda to pursue from economic to education, to health, to uh, economic. I mean, we have a very broad and deep relationship, but of course, with the advent of COVID-19, as I've said here publicly, working now in the health situation is my first, second, and third priority to attend to the 1500 staff at the U.S. mission to work with the 275,000 resident Americans here that uh, also we serve. And then of course, being a good uh, friend and partner with the government and people of Brazil as they address this pandemic. And so it certainly has had an impact. I'm speaking to you from my office in my home. I'm not at the embassy and we're at 95% telework. But that hasn't slowed up our, our work. We continue to work on a broad range of topics and issues that we'll get into later. But right now we're focused very much on being the best possible partner with Brazil as we share this, this very difficult experience of how to address a pandemic and the loss of life. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Forster, I do want to pose the same question to you, and I'll tag on to that question as well. The question of whether you think that there are opportunities for bilateral cooperation that you didn't envision pre-coronavirus, but that today are um, especially relevant. Thank you, Roberta. Let me start by thanking the Atlantic Council, Adrian Arsh, for her leadership in this, and also APEX and MCHEM for organizing this uh, very timely conversation. Also like to thank Ambassador Chapman for being here with us today. Uh, let me start, uh, you know, you, you mentioned a, a personal note. I had the highly dubious honor of being a pioneer in getting the COVID back in March. And I had a very mild case. And uh, our priority, you know, from, from the get go was to make sure that our team at the embassy uh, was safe. And uh, I'm happy to report that we have not had a, a, another case uh, you know, with all uh, the people that work at, at our embassy, we took several measures to, to make that possible, including Italian working. Uh, since then, you know, it was right after the historic meeting, the historic dinner of both our presidents in Mar-a-Lago, that the pandemic really took off here in the U.S. and then in Brazil. And uh, we had this big challenge of keeping the tremendous energy, the tremendous uh, uh, vision that was coming from our heads of state since Mar-a-Lago, to keep that momentum, to keep that agenda going. And I think we've done exactly that. You asked me about specifically what you know uh, we are doing that we would not have done, done without a pandemic. And I think first and foremost, we have a tremendous uh, ongoing cooperation between our countries uh, at all levels. 
and uh, there's a great work being done by uh, Ambassador Chapman and the whole team at the embassy there in Brasilia uh, in terms of, you know, uh, having an ongoing dialogue for research, for vaccine, for testing, uh, for new uh, therapies to, to deal with this uh, terrible disease. There have been, you know, uh, donations from the American government which have been highly appreciated by the Brazilian people, you know, in terms of ventilators, medicines, etc. So, you know, this is one, one more area where uh, our friendship and, uh, you know, uh, uh, our renewed alliance uh, shows uh, itself. Thank you, sir. Um, Ambassador Chapman, I wanted to pivot from that, um, talking a little bit as well, not only about um, what new opportunities have evolved from the pandemic, but what, what you also see as biggest opportunities for deepening um, the bilateral economic relations nowadays in this context. Um, and I would add to that as well for you, um, we know that both Presidents Donald Trump and Jair Bolsonaro had uh, an initial reaction to COVID-19, wherein they compared it to something more mild, um, a cold or a flu. And so my question is as well, what has um, each government learned since then? How has their approach evolved? And then what lessons do you think that the United States can provide Brazil and vice versa, Brazil can provide the United States on this? Yeah, well, first of all, Roberta, I would point out the fact that the partnership between Brazil and U.S. on health matters is truly long-standing. We have had an office of the CDC within the Ministry of Health since 2011. And we have here resident a health attache, Dr. Amy Dubois, an epidemiologist. Uh, and we have a wide array of assistance and more important opportunities to exchange scientific and medical information with one another that is very active, very vibrant, and that has only increased during this uh, pandemic period. So we have a lot to learn from each other. We have a lot of scientific information to share. We work with not only the Ministry of Health, and I was uh, met with the minister earlier this week, but also with Theo Cruz, the very well-respected uh, medical uh, research uh, operation here in Brazil. So really, uh, we, have, we have a long-standing relationship on health, and it's only getting better and more profound. On the economic opportunities coming out of COVID-19, I would say it is really related to the deepening and broadening of the already significant relationship we have. We have huge relationships in manufacturing, uh, the financial sector, uh, agriculture. Uh, this relationship is broad and deep. And so the focus now of our governments is to try and create even an improving uh, economic and business environment so that the established relationships can grow and we can imagine new areas of cooperation and economic opportunity, whether it's in financial tech, whether it's in digital trade, uh, whether it's in figuring out new ways to have scientific research facilities in, in each other's countries to take advantage of the burgeoning relationship between a number of our universities. So there really are a, just a tremendous number of opportunities right now. And our job now as governments and as ambassadors is to do everything that we can to facilitate those dialogues. And I'm very pleased to report that even during this time that we're all addressing the pandemic, these economic discussions between our technical trade economic agencies are progressing at a very rapid clip. Uh, Ambassador, I'd like to um, pick up on something you mentioned. You mentioned various industries in which Brazil and the United States co cooperate very closely. Yeah. Um, Ambassador Forster, kind of passing on to you, um, I did want to ask which, I know that all industries have been affected deeply by this, but for Brazil, from Brazil's perspective, which industries have been most impacted over the few months? And then how can closer ties with the United States from Brazil's perspective, especially in trade and investment, position Brazil to kind of get back out from under this difficult time period looking forward? Absolutely, Renata. If I can backtrack just one point to, to uh, refer to what was done on COVID in Brazil, there was uh, some uh, misinterpretations of the approach that was taken by the federal government. You know, like the United States, Brazil is a federative republic, so you have the three levels of, uh, of government. 
And in Brazil, there has been a clear division between the role played by the federal government in providing the resources and setting some guidelines and the, the guidelines being enforced and um, let's say microtune by local governments, state governors and local administrations. Uh, President Bolsonaro from the outset has said basically two things about how to fight COVID. He said that in a country as large and as regionally diverse as Brazil, it's very hard to have a one size fits all solution. So solutions should be adjusted at the local level. And that has proven right as we have excellent results in some parts of Brazil that haven't taken apparently you know, uh, the right measures uh, to fight this. The other point is that this is a public health emergency, but it does not, it's not only a health issue. It has tremendous repercussions and impact for you know, social questions, economic questions. And the view of uh, our uh, uh, the President Bolsonaro's government has been that we should tackle all these fronts at the same time. We cannot do only one in detriment and forget, leave the others behind. Otherwise, the results uh, might, might be very tough for, for our population. So we've been trying this integrated approach, which uh, ended up being praised by, by international organizations. Uh, now, uh, in terms of, uh, of the, the possibilities, I mean, uh, the, the industries that were hit hardest, in Brazil, like worldwide, uh, travel, tourism, you know, the durable goods industry haven't perhaps taken the, the, the hardest hit. Uh, it should be bear in, mind, bear in mind that this is temporary. At the same time, Brazil is uh, set to harvest the largest uh, uh, harvest in uh, agricultural, in our agribusiness uh, ever this year. So there's a tremendous growth in the agricultural sector, even during this uh, terrible situation of the pandemic. It also should be noted that Brazil has been the country least affected in terms of its foreign trade among the G20 countries data that just came out last week. So we are showing some resilience uh, in, uh, in our trade performance abroad, which, uh, you know, uh, I think it's, it's good news uh, looking forward. Thank you, sir. Um, I have one last question for both of you, and then I would like to pivot over to um, what the next phase might be of the U.S.-Brazil trade and FDI relationship. My last question is, um, Ambassador Forster, as you've mentioned, um, the two countries have dealt with the, the crisis in unique ways in the context that makes the most sense for them um, and working between the federal and the local government. Um, as both Brazil and the United States do this, um, how have, do you think, their respective approaches impacted how investors perceive the two countries? And then as a follow-up question to that, um, we can't ignore that on, on last week, May 27th, um, the U.S. began restricting entry of um, non-U.S. citizens who had been previously in Brazil for 14 days from coming in. Um, Ambassador Forster, for you in particular, how do you think that this measure and other measures of this type might impact investment, bilateral investment? It's designed to be a, a public health measure, and uh, you know we expect it will not have a great impact on, on bilateral trade and investment. Uh, mind you that Brazil had taken the same measure uh, back in March 27th. We established restrictions on all foreigners, not only on Americans, but all foreigners coming uh, by plane to, to Brazil due uh, to, to health, to public health concerns uniquely. As it, it, as, it, as it was the case here in the United States. There are exceptions, you know, it's important that people who look at this know that, you know, people who have relatives in the United States who are permanent residents here, are green card holders, et cetera, there's a, a series of exceptions as there are in, in Brazil in our restrictions, uh, which, you know, give some leeway for essential travel to continue. But those, those measures are temporary, you know, they should uh, go away as soon as, as the numbers start to improve, which we expect. Uh, will be soon. In terms of opportunities, I, I like to quote what Minister Paulo Guedes has recently said, that the pandemic should not be an excuse to do less or to procrastinate, but to do more and to accelerate the process of economic reform in Brazil. And that's exactly what we intend to do. And, uh, you know, we, we expect that by the end of this year, we'll be able to tackle the most important tax reform uh, on top of the reforms we have undertaken last year, which, you know, have put Brazil perhaps in a better shape to, to, to face the dire economic situation, the challenges we have ahead. Second thing, a final point, is that we should uh, be very clear about measures that are being taken uh, momentarily, temporarily, to fight uh, the disease and its economic effects, uh, what uh, you know some have called a wartime measures, and the commitments of the Brazilian government to fiscal uh, responsibility, sustainability uh, going forward. 
and you know basically the, the commitment to accelerate and reform. Thank you, sir. Before we do pivot over to US Brazil trade and FDI Ambassador Chapman, is there anything you'd like to add related to COVID-19 and the US's priorities in combating the pandemic? You know, I think uh, we, we've covered that pretty well. We're, we're going to continue with the assistance that we're providing to the Brazilians, um, both to the government and to the private sector through uh, international organizations and Brazilian organizations here. And I just want to underscore something Ambassador Forster just mentioned. The Brazilian government here has been firmly intent on uh, accelerating the economic reform measures. I read some of the international economic press that has taken a very bearish view on the ability of the government to pass its economic reform measures. I can only tell you what I have experienced here in Brasilia. And that is, as I meet with the ministries, as I meet with the head of the Congress, I've been meeting with the, the leaders, including the president of the, um, the Congress, uh, President Rodrigo Maia, there is even a firmer commitment to economic reform. And so we're working on that with them. We're having very good technical talks about every um, so many different issues, uh, whether it's on, on tax, whether it's on uh, digital trade, whether it's on mining regulations, whatever it is, we're having extensive conversations with this government. And uh, so I, I believe the international press largely has it incorrect uh, based on my own experience uh, interacting with the government leaders. And we're encouraging this. We believe that these economic reform measures are the ones that are going to allow this economic partnership with Brazil to grow even further as we come out of the COVID-19 crisis. Thank you, sir. Um, I do remind before we pivot over to the economic uh, theme, I want to remind our audiences that you can submit questions for the ambassadors in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Type it in in about 10 minutes to close. We will take some questions from the public. Um, so I do want to talk now about um, the next phase of the trade and FDI relationship. Um, about two months ago, as we mentioned earlier, um, before the virus really hit, uh, the Atlantic Council, along with you, Ambassador Forster, and uh, representatives from both the United States and Brazil, we showcased the scope of the U.S.-Brazil trade and FDI ties in a comprehensive report that we launched with short-term and long-term recommendations. Um, and we saw uh, last night some members of the Committee on Ways and Means of the U.S. Congress sending a letter as well to U.S. Trade Representative Lighthizer citing some concerns. Um, Ambassador Forster, my question to you is both, could you tell us more about the progress the U.S. and Brazil are making in, in deepening the trade discussions and what they've done in the past few months? Um, and then also as well, I did want to give you the opportunity to share your perspective on efforts that address environmental protections and that address labor standards, which were two themes that were raised in the letter as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me start by uh, just mentioning, you know, the tremendous progress as Ambassador Chapman uh, referred to. We, uh, we are not sitting idly during all this time, much to the contrary. We've been extremely busy and we've conducted, you know, several meetings under the framework of the Agreement on Trade and Economic Cooperation, ATAC. We also had an edition of the Commercial Dialogue. We also have a preparatory meeting for the next CEO Forum, which will take place sometime uh, uh, in Brazil uh, in the second semester. Those discussions have enabled us to make concrete progress towards achieving the vision that our president set at Mar-a-Lago, you know, we're having a meaningful trade and economic package by the end of this year. Uh, we have, you know, uh, made a lot of progress in what regards trade facilitation. That's one area where we are, you know, very close to wrapping up conversations, I'd say. We have ongoing talks on uh, good regulatory practices and e-commerce. Those talks are well advanced, you know, and we expect to have something by the end of the year, which was the date set. On top of that, we have just begun discussions on anti-corruption measures, you know, an anti-corruption package that we could agree on. We have just received the, the proposal from the US side and we'll be taking a look at it and reacting uh, to it in, in the, the coming days and weeks. Uh, we also have uh, begun uh, what uh, we should call uh, a dialogue on uh, intellectual property issues. We have received some issues of interest uh, for the American side. 
And we have agreed to take a look, a joint uh, a look at those issues and have an ongoing dialogue, exchange information, which might, might be very helpful looking forward. We see all this, you know, as stepping stones towards something more ambitious at the end for a, a more meaningful uh, 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 commercial agreement uh, at certain point in the near future. I'd just like to highlight one point before addressing the question of the letter. Uh, that, you know, if you look at the report issued by the Atlantic Council two months ago, and I understand you're releasing the Portuguese version today, right? That's uh, right. Very welcome. Uh, if you look at the issues recommended by the Atlantic Council, uh, APEX, uh, uh, MGM, and Chamber of Commerce, US Brazil, a business council, those who had inputs into the, that study, you see there's a tremendous convergence between the views of the private sector and the views of the two governments. And I think that's key and that's essential for us to be able to continue to move forward at the speed we are moving, you know, this tremendous synergy that has uh, that comes from uh, having the, 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 the private sector fully on board and we paying attention to what you're telling us that, you know, are your areas of concern. As for, for the letter, you know, uh, that's part of the process, you know, that uh, some uh, uh, the congressman will express concerns about this or that issue. It's very helpful to us to engage in those discussions so we can clarify points, uh, misinformation that might be around. Uh, look, you know, uh, you mentioned the environment. Last year we had this big outcry about the, the you know, the Amazon being on fire. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time and it, it's time well spent, quite frankly, you know, on the Hill and with people in the U.S., you know, different areas of the government, the administration, NGOs, etc., explaining and bringing facts, you know, and dispelling myths. So, you know, this administration, President Bolsonaro's administration, is as committed to environmental protection in Brazil as any other administration. The, 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 what's different this time? is that President Bolsonaro has expressed a big concern about the 25 million Brazilians who live in the Amazon region who are among the poorest of Brazilians. So what we've been saying is that, you know, we need to bring sustainable development to those people, both sides, the environmental conservation protection on one side, but also economic opportunity and growth for those people who need it badly. Thank you, sir. Um, Ambassador Chapman, and also to you, Ambassador Forster, um, you did, we did mention this um, chapter specific multi chapter trade enhancement agreement. And as we understand it, the two governments are currently in discussion about this. Um, so my question is, to both of you, what will an agreement that addresses trade facilitation, digital trade, um, and good regulatory practice mean for the two countries? And then for those who might not be trade specialists or who might not be focusing on trade, um, what are the practical implications of an agreement like this one? Ambassador Chapman, I'll start with you. Okay, good. Now, in my professional experience, whenever a country is talking about very detailed subjects, that's a very good sign. Because when a government is, you know, the relationships are not as strong, you say, No, I think we froze just for a second. Ambassador Chapman, can you hear us? Ambassador Forster, I might pass the question on to you then while we see if we can reconnect with Ambassador yeah. Chapman. Let me see if I can try to follow up on the same track of mind that Ambassador Chapman was uh, was following, mm -hmm. you know, about getting uh, specific and what the, 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 this means. I mean, we talk about trade facilitation. It sounds kind of esoteric, good regulatory practice. These sorts of areas are fundamental in getting rid of red tape of inefficiencies built into our, uh, our systems, you know, getting rid of red tape, uh, streamlining the process of, you know, the commercial operations import export between the two countries. This has to do with uh, providing, you know, a much desired transparency for the, the way uh, foreign trade works on, on both sides. Uh, having very practical uh, things like, you know, a one window for uh, you know, all export or import operations with a very clear process on how to address concerns, grievances that uh, the companies uh, uh, might have. Uh, so this, this is a direct and, uh, and, uh, and I say very important effect uh, on, uh, on trade. We, we know people tend to, to concentrate too much on tariffs, tariffs. Sometimes when you talk about uh, uh, foreign trade, there's a study by UNCTAD that says that you know regulatory the, the whole regulatory framework 
if it's addressed properly, it can bring a reduction, which would be a tariff equivalent of anything between 12 and 20 percent. So, you know, you, you see that there is even a component of trade liberalization in that, even though we're not discussing tariffs, we're discussing rules. And rules seem to be the future of international trade much more than just, uh, you know, the, the numeric uh, uh, quotas and tariffs uh, uh, barriers to, to, to the export of goods. So I think this is, you know, it's uh, unquestionably very meaningful for both our countries. And uh, we expect very concrete results coming out of this. And as I said, we see this as stepping stones, as building blocks towards something bigger and, and more encompassing. Thank you, sir. I think we did disconnect with the Ambassador Chapman just briefly. So actually, while he reconnects, um, I think this is a good opportunity to take some questions from the audience. We did just get some on this topic. Um, so Ambassador Forster, the question we have from the audience is um, related somewhat, but also expands to the European Union. So um, the question was, how is Brazil navigating its relationship with the US given the market access and regulatory commitments that Brazil made in the EU Mercosur trade agreement? And are there any lessons learned or frameworks that are being adopted in this relationship, specifically when it comes to sensitive industries? So rules of origin, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, e excellent question, excellent question. Look, we are not, Brazil and the United States are not engaged in, a, you know, in, in tariff concessions, market access negotiations, as we, we just uh, did, uh, wrapped up last year with the European Union. Uh, just a parenthesis, we, we wrapped up, up, up those negotiations after 20 years. We don't expect, you know, our you know, ongoing conversation with the United States to have to last that long. You know, it's two decades might, might be too much. But so what we see is on one point, there is a very interesting interplay between what we did with Europeans and what we want to do with the United States. And we are doing with other countries. We have ongoing talks with Canada, with South Korea. We're starting talks with Japan. So basically, Brazil wants to open up its economy. We see that in our as something in our own interest. You know, I have a colleague who works at the Ministry of the Economy who likes to repeat that the most meaningful trade agreement for Brazil is not with the European Union, even though it's the largest in history. It's not with the United States, largest economy in the world. The most meaningful uh, trade agreement for Brazil would be a free trade agreement with Brazil itself. You know, reducing its costs, cutting red tape, eliminating inefficient uh, bureaucracy, basically reducing the cost of doing business in Brazil, uh, which only brings inefficiencies and, in, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's not very helpful to, to, to help us attract foreign investment. In terms of the framework uh, that we are using, of course, you know, the agreement we, we have uh, celebrated with Europeans is, is a, a very updated agreement, let's say, in, you know, it encompasses all the new sector in terms of technology, intellectual property, sensitive issues the sensitive issues tend to vary they are you know they tend to be country specific even region specific uh, when we engage in a, in a free trade negotiation so you know that's something that you know it will be an interesting experience for for us to 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 learn from what we did with the europeans but it's not something that can be immediately applied to anything we're doing right now but the framework in, in you know in some areas like the disciplines the rules i think there, there'll be a lot to do because this is a state-of-the-art agreement as well Great, sir. Um, we did have a second question, and I know that it's one that you and I have discussed and we've discussed in depth in the group uh, over the last year, um, but it was regarding a free trade agreement. And the question was, um, how achievable is a free trade agreement in 2020, which I, I think I know the answer to, but um, when could we expect an FTA to be signed between the US and Brazil? Look, I don't have any, any crystal ball in that regard. <laughs> There is there is the ultimate goal, and that's the, you know, there, there are signals from both sides that uh, that uh, is a, a goal that both our countries think is worth pursuing. Uh, you know, in the medium term, how soon we'll be able to work with it, uh, it's not clear. <clears throat> there are questions. You know, there are uh, legal requirements both on the U.S. side, less on Brazil side. Uh, we are more deregulated in that in that in that aspect, but there there are things that need to be observed and rights that need to be followed. And, uh, you know, I understand that uh, they'll they they are, they are be taken care of when the time uh, is, is appropriate. Now, I like to, instead of thinking, you know, when can we have an FDA? I like, since my, my friend Ambassador Chapman is not here, I'll try to fill in for him and s repeat something he recently said, which I, I uh, liked very much. He said, we should work with the goal 
of doubling the trade between Brazil and the U.S. Trade between Brazil is roughly $105 billion last year. There's tremendous potential to do much more than that, you know. Uh, Mexico, of course, you have a free trade agreement. You do six times more trade with Mexico than you do with Brazil. Uh, and Brazil is a much larger economy. So there, there's tremendous, tremendous room for growth there. And I would like to add one thing to what to Mr. To Ambassador Chapman said is, you know, I think this goal is ambitious, doubling trade in five years. It's an ambitious goal, but it's absolutely feasible. I think we should add to that, I don't know the time frame, but we, we also should look into doubling investment, bilateral investment, both ways, both ways. If you look at the Brazilian investment in the United States, it has grown 350% in the past decade. You know, it, it, it increased three and a half times. So there, there's room for growth also in the investment side. And one reinforces the other and generates this very virtuous cycle, which is, you know, what we aim at with the reforms we are undertaking in Brazil. Thank you, sir. I did just hear that Ambassador Chapman's internet had some issues, which I think we all know is <laughs> a risk of this virtual new world. He's connecting by phone, so we should have him back shortly. Um, but Ambassador Forster, I did want to then pivot to the third part of our conversation. I know we only have about 15 minutes left, um, which is priorities for the future. And um, I wanted to talk to you particularly about the OECD. Um, Brazil's taken concrete steps to be compliant with OECD's standards. Uh, it continues to advance on adhering to various regulatory best practices in, in agriculture, in tax information sharing, protection of e-commerce. Um, this year, the U.S. formally backed Brazil for OECD membership. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, where does Brazil stand right now in regard to the accession to the OECD? We're ready. We're ready to get in as soon as the door opens. You know, that that door is being kept shut for 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 a, a while because of you know the whole uh, uh, political aspects of the organization. We have the full support of the United States government. We are highly appreciative of that. Being the U.S., you know, the largest uh, member, largest economy in, in the OECD, we are waiting for European uh, countries uh, to show uh, you know some uh, some way forward in terms of you know. Well, will we need an European country uh, being announced as well or not? Uh, we hope we can solve this pretty fast. You know, we look at this more at a substantive point of view. Why does Brazil want to join the OECD? And we really, this is really a priority for us. Why? Because we see a tremendous synergy, a complementarity between what we want to do in terms of economic reform and the kinds of disciplines, and levels of discipline that would be required from Brazil by joining the OECD. Roberta, as you know, Brazil has already joined uh, like 82% of the 250, uh, 82 agreements of the 250 something that the OECD has in as, uh, you know, its, its legal framework. It's the country that has more, uh, joined more agreements than anybody who's a, who's a candidate. We're doing that, we'll continue to do that. And we think that, you know, there is a tremendous play, the positive play that can come from OECD, uh, you know, what we do with Europeans and what we are doing with the United States and what we intend, what we are doing to do uh, domestically. So one complements the other. If I can mention one thing, you know, just to, to complement, if I have time for that very briefly, uh, I'd just like to mention a couple of sectors where we also uh, want to deepen our relationship with the United States, which we didn't mention, uh, like space cooperation. You know, it's mm -hmm. not only that the satellite launching from the Alcantara base, uh, we had the Technological Safeguards Agreement signed last year. It's in full force in Brazil. Brazilian Congress did a tremendous job, both the, the Chamber and the Senate, you know, proving that at record speed. And our the Brazilian Space Agency is working very closely with American companies to try to put that to good use uh, very soon. We're also working with NASA within the Artemis project. Uh, we also have a tremendous cooperation in the defense and military industries and so on. Just to highlight those other areas, which, uh, you know, I didn't mention before, to see how broad this cooperation is and how broad this agenda is. And of course, getting to the OECD is paramount into that effort. Thank you, sir. I do believe we have Ambassador Chapman back on. He'll be audio only. Ambassador Chapman, can you hear us? We'll give him a few minutes. Ambassador Chapman, can you hear me? <laughs> Well, I'll give him a minute. Um, Ambassador Forster, I, I also wanted to ask you about the World Trade Organization because Brazil's been formally um, show, showing interest in joining the WTO's government, government procurement pact. Um, what does this mean for Brazil going forward? 
It means a lot. It's very, it's, it's a, another very important signal in the same direction of economic reform for Brazil. Uh, Brazil is going to be the first, has been the first Latin American country to formally uh, announce its bid to join the pact. It will open for Brazil the government procurement markets of 34 other countries. That's a market estimating $1.7 trillion every year. Uh, Brazil has the sixth largest market in the world uh, for, for government procurement. So there are many opportunities in Brazil, you know, with all the needs we have in infrastructure and, and, and so on. What will it bring? It will bring transparency. It will help us, you know, curb corruption, you know, strengthen uh, uh, our ability in, in, of governance in, in that area, which is, a, a, again, a vital area for economic reform. So it's part of the broader effort, and it, it's, a, it's a great one, I think. Thank you, sir. Um, I did want to, I know we are maybe 13 minutes out um, and we have AmCham CEO Deborah Vietas will join us in a little bit to close the event. Um, but Ambassador Forster, I wanted to um, ask you two kind of concluding questions. Um, one is the long-term goal here is the conclusion of in addition to a free trade agreement, a double taxation agreement, a bilateral investments agreement, so in what ways could these three agreements open doors for um, your economy? And lastly, my last question to you would be if you could leave us with a sense of what your vision for the bilateral relationship is both yet this year and beyond it to 2021. Excellent, excellent. Look, we've been trying to do a double taxation agreement for a long time. It's a shame we haven't been able to conclude it. I think we are very close now in terms of, you know, the, the willingness to do it. Uh, of course, it would be wise to see the final form that tax reform takes in the Brazilian Congress. You know, let's, let's see that that bill gets approved, uh, hopefully by the end of this year. And then we'll be in a tremendous position to, you know, sit down with our American friends at Treasury and other agencies and, and have this done. Uh, the same goes for the investment agreement. We have come much closer in recent uh, in recent years. Uh, you know, we had basic differences in dispute settlement, etc. We are past that now, uh, which I think will open the door for us to to have some sort of investment agreement. Which again, it's it's something that the private sector wants. The CEO forum has been recommending, uh, you know, the, the think tanks and so on. And it's something that we see is very much in our interest in trying to attract investment. Uh, looking forward. There's one thing that, you know, Brazil is poised, I think, to bring together several factors, which I already mentioned here, domestic economic reform, the agreement, uh, the free trade agreement with the European Union, uh, which will come into force in one or two years, uh, you know, our ongoing talks with the United States for a closer economic and trade relationship, our accession to the OECD, all those point in the same direction of a more open Brazil, a Brazil where you can do business at a lower cost with a, you know, um, more incentives and more efficiency. We hope that that might position Brazil to benefit from some of the rerouting chains of supply, chains of value that you know, might be uh, uh, redirection uh, closer to the United States or closer to our hemisphere. Brazil will be ready to, to, to take those investments and uh, you know, make the best thinking about, you know, of course, bringing economic opportunity for, for all Brazilians. Just one concluding thing. So I see that uh, Ambassador Chapman is back. Mm -hmm. We can leave some hard questions for him. Just want to mention <laughs> one looking forward. We have a big milestone coming up uh, for Brazilians. Mm -hmm. In 2022, we'll celebrate the 200th uh, anniversary of our independence. And I think we should mark that with symbolic things. One of the things that we've been thinking about is doing a joint scientific experiment uh, on board of the Artemis project. So Brazil and U.S. cooperate in, in science, you know, in a, some sort of lunar experiment. That's one thing that's, you know, very symbolic, you know, kind of visionary. But of course, that comes with all this very large agenda. And I think we can, you know, looking, for, let's say, into 2022, I would hope to get there with a stronger and deeper partnership between the two largest democracies in the Western Hemisphere, countries who share, you know, so much history, principles, values, and who are, you know, today coming so closer together to the, in part to the proximity of our heads of state. That's, I would say, for, for the future.
Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Forster. Welcome back, Ambassador Chapman. Uh, I know that we always run the risk of internet issues. It's no problem and our audience is very used to it. And you came back at a perfect moment, I think, um, to sort of close out our session with priorities for the future. Um, we took some questions from the audience, not only about the possibility of a free trade agreement and when we might expect that, um, which I'll pose to you that question as well. Um, but then I did also want to pose to you um, two final questions. The first is, um, what do you think the two countries can be doing together in addition to what they're doing now? What more, what other opportunities are there as we look to 2021? Um, and the second question is the one that I just asked Ambassador Forster as well is, could you leave us with a sense of what your vision is for the bilateral relationship both this year yet and into next year? Yeah, thank you very much, Roberta. And I'm sorry the, the <laughs> internet at the house went out and I was scrambling, but I'm back. And I'm sure that I agree with uh, everything Ambassador Forster said in my absence, but I will go back and check the tape. You can be <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, this is a relationship that is mature, that's got history, it's broad, it's deep, but it, it is still, in my view, one that can be so enhanced because our bilateral trade is $105 billion a year. And uh, our bilateral trade with Mexico is over $600 billion a year. So it's why I have set for ourselves a very ambitious target of doubling our trade in five years. And at 15% growth a year, that's possible. How do you get there? You get there by in improving the overall business climate here in Brazil to make it more attractive for investment, not less attractive. And you do it by reducing every kind of non-tariff trade barrier you can imagine. And the good thing that's happening right now is that's exactly what we're working on as a team. Our, our economic teams are meeting constantly to look at very specific issues, which is what I was talking about when I got cut off, is that the more specific the dialogue, you then know the more progress that you're gonna be making. And that is the objective that's been set for us by our presidents, a very ambitious target to, to reach uh, for commercial agreements that will advance this relationship. And that's what we're about. And that's what we're working on. You know, the, what can we do together? I think that one thing that you, you have to look at is as the world is reconsidering value chains and uh, where, where we should have uh, strategic production agreements with countries that share values, certainly Brazil is one of the places where United States uh, private sector is gonna be looking because Brazil is an established industrial nation. And it shares our values, and it's 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 one that we want to get closer to. So this is a tremendous time for us to do the spade work necessary to allow that to happen towards the end of this year and the beginning of next year. And, and so I think that's uh, that's a tremendous opportunity. What's the vision for this relationship? Our presidents have been very clear. They want to see this become a a fundamentally strong alliance a North-South American alliance here in the Western Hemisphere that really sets, sets the course when it comes to shared values, when it talked about um, bringing together our production cycles and our, our, our investment flows going both ways. This is a relationship that is destined to grow. And our job as, as leaders of our, our embassies in each other's country is to facilitate those kinds of discussions. And the good news is that is happening. And so I'm very bullish on where we're going to be going with this relationship over the next 12 to 18 months. Thank you so much, sir. I think that's the perfect place to leave our conversation for today. Um, I do want to take the last five minutes to introduce Debra Vietas. She is the CEO of AmCham Brazil. AmCham Brazil's vice president is one of the co-authors of our report and the Portuguese version of which we're launching today. Um, Debra, I want to pass the floor on to you um, for your perspectives also from the commercial side of things on um, the future of a multi-chapter trade agreement and its impacts, the potential of a free trade agreement, and really what opportunities are there for deepening U.S.-Brazil trade and FDI? Thank you, Roberta. After such an inspired conversation between Ambassador Chapman and Foster, I would like to wrap up 
this relevant seminar with a message from the business sector. In line with what was said here, I believe we have a great opportunity before us to enhance the bilateral trade and investment ties between Brazil and the US. Our relationship has been under, underperforming for too long, and finally, we have the chance to aim for higher ground. In order to make the best out of this opportunity, it is crucial to strike the right balance between short and mid-term initiatives, or in other terms, between uh, being pragmatic and having ambitious goals. By the way, just as suggested in the report released today by the Atlantic Council and at Apex Brazil. In this sense, uh, we should seize the momentum built in this past 18 months between the two governments to secure what we call the phase one of a bilateral trade agreement still in 2020, including commitments in the areas that were mentioned, such as trade facilitation, good regulatory practices, digital trade, anti-corruption as well. These disciplines would modernize the legal framework which regulates trade and investments between the two countries, as well as unlock economic benefits for both of our countries. They, they would also serve as an initial step toward concluding a more comprehensive agreement in the future. Also in the near term, we understand that there are other relevant initiatives at hand, such as the full participation of Brazil in the global entry, the initiation of formal talks for a treaty to avoid double taxation, the adoption of e-documents in bilateral trade, and the implementation of the recommendations of the CEO Forum. These actions are feasible, although they demand political support and considerable hard work from both sides. And they are even more valuable in the current context when we are facing harsh social and economic consequences of this unprecedented pandemic with brutal recession in global trade and investments. Beyond 2020, we should aim for concluding the double taxation agreement, as well as a comprehensive trade agreement, including issues such as tariffs, services, and public procurement. In this sense, having already achieved a phase one deal will be indeed of great help. And should the US government use the window they still have this year to consult with Congress and perhaps even notify its intent to negotiate a trade agreement with Brazil, that should be uh, one step closer to our goal. Of course, uh, considering the US elections in next November and the fact that there is no consensus for the negotiation of a more comprehensive trade agreement with Brazil, there is the issue of continuity. Leading a non-partisan organization such as MCHAM Brazil, I feel, I feel it is important to say that regardless of the results of the elections, it is of utmost relevance to create the conditions for the continuity of these initiatives. And this includes obviously uh, the improvement of Brazil's relations with the US Congress, which will be key to any future agreement. But I couldn't end uh, without uh, thanking the Atlantic Council and the and APEX for the long partnership with MCM Brazil. My special thanks to Adrian Erst, Jason Marshall, Roberta Braga, and all other members of the Atlantic Council's team who worked for the success of this meeting today. My enthusiastic greetings as well to General Jefferson Menandro and to Mr. Sergio Segovia, President president of APEX. I also reiterate the great interest and the support of MCM Brazil uh, to this next level of the development of the bilateral relations and bid good luck to both our ambassador in, their, in this mission. Thank, thank you so much, Nevra. Um, I do want to reiterate uh, thank you to Apex Brazil for the ongoing partnership. Thank you to AmCham. Um, we've been working conversations with you 
for so long. And it's really great to have you close today's event. Um, thank you, Ambassadors Forrester and Chapman. We at the Atlantic Council look forward to continuing this work. Um, and I do want to let everyone know that the next event of the series is confirmed for June 16th from 9 to 10 a.m. Eastern. Um, and we will have representatives from the private sector sharing their perspectives in Portuguese, um, one of which will be Abdel Neto, one of the authors of the report uh, and executive vice president of AmCham Brazil. So thank you again to everyone who joined today. Um, thank you to all of our speakers. And we look forward to continuing to engage with you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Roberta. Appreciate it. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta.